Can I tell you a story? Actually, you know what? Before I do that, let me let me clarify some things. <laughs> when I was in school, my favorite subject was English, uh, primarily because I loved reading the little stories in the literature textbook um, and uh, dissecting them in my own head. But I also hated my English lessons with equal measure because. You see, at the end of reading those wonderful little stories, I would be handed out a, a moral of the story, you know, and I hated having someone else's perception of what that story meant shoved down my throat. So here's what we'll do today. Today, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories, one from the pages of history and one from my own life, and I'll share my own thoughts about them, but I want you to perceive what those stories mean and what you can take away from them however you want. Yeah? All right, let's get started. Here's the first one. The year is 1914 and scientists and engineers from around the world are hard at work trying to build a plane that can cross the Atlantic Ocean in one go. At the time, it was a significant technological challenge. And a celebrated public figure has just put out a press release saying that the men who were attempting to do these were absolute fools. He believed that no engine will have the capacity to withstand the strain of flying for more than 100 miles an hour for 17 or 18 hours consecutively. He said, and I quote, I should not dream of attempting it. Well, eventually, in 1927, just 13 years later, Charles Lindbergh makes his historic flight non-stop from New York to Paris. And this man was proved wrong. Who was this man who got his prediction so wrong? Well, it was none other than Orville Wright, one of the Wright brothers, the people who actually invented and built the first successful airplane. Funny. Let's move on to the second story real quick. This one's closer to home. The year is 1992 and the city is New Delhi, and a boy is born to a couple. The parents are not well off financially and they're struggling, but they work tirelessly day and night to pool in all their spare money to give the kid a decent enough education. Two decades later, this boy decides one day that he wants to go to the US to study science and, and engineering, something that people from his financial background don't even dream of doing. His relatives tell him it's a dumb move because, well, he has no money. His teachers with years of experience tell him it's a bad decision because, well, he isn't very good at his studies uh, as reflected by his grades and report cards. Older and more experienced friends around him tell him that, well, he would be particularly better off working towards a stable 9 to 5 job here in India. <laughs> but he's an idiot. So he ignores all of that and somehow manages to find a way to achieve what he set out to do. And a decade later, in the US, he has now worked on a couple of research projects for the student wing of NASA. He has spearheaded the modernization of the electric grid in a number of states in America. He even founded a startup that um, helped invent uh, an innovative new way of producing clean, renewable hydrogen fuel. For all of this, he is put on the Forbes 30 under 30 list at the age of 25. And till date, he continues to ignore other people's perceptions of his limitations. And he continues to work on idiotic ideas that more experienced and knowledgeable people around him tell him are absolutely foolish. I guess what I'm trying to say is that limitations are nothing more than perceptions. But that doesn't mean that limitations aren't real just because they are perceptions. I mean, if anything, uh, a number of scientific fields have taught us that human perceptions are integral and complementary to our understanding of reality. In fact, sometimes they even shape our reality. So why are most of us not able to remove our limitations if they are so linked to our perceptions? Why is it that no matter how hard we try, sometimes it feels like 
it is an immovable object. I mean, I can read a book and I can get better knowledge and I can improve or change my perception of the world around me. So why can't I do the same with my limitations? You see, the problem, I think, happens because there's a disconnect here. Most of us, most of the time, are not trying to solve the limitations set by our own perceptions. The problem is that we are often using other people's perceptions of reality to judge our own limitations. A lot of the time, a lot of us are trying to figure out how to solve for the wrong set of limitations. Oops, I almost forgot. Um, I almost went into giving you a moral lecture. Uh, you know what? That's on me. My bad. Let me dial it back. Let's get back to the first story. Yeah, the Wright brothers. When they started out with their ambitious plan of being the first humans to fly, they faced many limitations and problems. They were not educated engineers. They were just two simple bicycle salesmen from Dayton, Ohio. They didn't have a lot of money. They had no access to fancy labs or equipment or libraries. In fact, during uh, their journey to build the first plane, they were in direct competition with a gentleman called Samuel Langley, who was a university professor, highly educated. Langley was also funded by the US military, so he had money. Langley spent, I think, uh, about $70,000 on his prototype of the plane, which then promptly crashed as it tried to take off. The Wright brothers were repeatedly told to give up their dream because if someone like Langley with all his education and all his funding couldn't do it, then what hope did two simple bicycle salesmen have? But you know what they did right? The Wright brothers? Pardon the pun. The Wright brothers chose to ignore the limitations that society and society's perceptions were placing before them. Instead, they chose to focus on solving the limitations that their own perceptions and their own knowledge and their own research were uncovering for them. They solved for a lack of knowledge of physics by going through discarded books. They solved for bad data by physically going out there in the countryside and, and making their own measurements with wind tunnels and wind socks. They solved for a lack of funding by learning how to build everything themselves in their shed. And they built everything from scratch and it just cost them $1,000 for their first prototype as compared to Langley's $70,000. And eventually, on December 17th, 1903, the Wright brothers took off into the skies, taking all of humanity with them. You see, they succeeded initially because they continuously evolved their perceptions of the world around them and through that, their own limitations. Through their insatiable curiosity, they were able to find and solve for the right set of limitations. But they were also unable to predict the next wave of aeronautic advancements because they failed to update their perceptions of society around them. They fell behind and then they were left solving for the wrong set of limitations and hence gave wrong predictions. Similarly, the boy from India, he was able to crawl out of the neat little hole that society was trying to put him into because, well, he just did not understand society's perceptions of his limitations. He only understood and trusted his own perceptions. And while initially it may have come from a place of uh, sheer uh, lack of worldly wisdom or teenage arrogance, he now does it methodically and uh, very intentionally and it helps. So the next time you are confronted with your own limitations and you're feeling weighed down or overwhelmed, which is natural, trust me, I've been there. I hope you'll take just a minute to pause and reflect on whether the limitations are actually yours or whether they have been placed at your feet by someone else or society and you were told that these are your limitations. But anyway, don't read too much into these stories. They're just stories. Just something to think about. Thank you so much for listening.